Hi everyone. So we're gonna start uh, our event immediately for right now, yeah. Okay, that's all I think. Okay, let's start then. <laughs> Hello everyone. Uh, how are you guys today? I hope everyone is okay despite everything that is going on with our lives right now because of coronavirus. <clears throat> So let me introduce myself. My name is Lutfi. I'm an associate from UMG Idea Lab. Today, I'm going to be your host <clears throat> for this event. So I'm going to mention a few rules for you guys. First of all, please mute your, please mute your phone uh, and don't use video, video on us. <clears throat> please write it in the chat section that is provided in, the, in your Zoom area. So there's going to be a few presentations from the committee. There's uh, the first presentation will be from UMG Idea Lab. Second one is from Ventura Discoveries. Third one is from Plug and Play Indonesia. And the last one is from uh, Alpha Momentum Indonesia. And after that, we're going to start our main event, which is Q&A with uh, Ventura Capitals. And uh, the panelists are, the first, one, uh, the first one is David from Angin. Second one is Tizar from Calibra, Calibra, sorry. The third one is Michelle from Skystar. And it will be moderated by uh, Melissa from Plug and Play Indonesia. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to start with the presentation from UMG Idea Lab, which is myself. I'm going to share screen with you guys. So what is UMG Idea Lab? UMG Idea Lab is Corporate Venture Capital founded in 2016. Our mission is to see collaboration with the finest generation of, of entrepreneurs to achieve their vision in this digital era. Our main business is, uh, there's like three main businesses. The first one is Venture Capital. Venture Capital, uh, I, I'm sure everyone already, already know what is Venture Capital. So Venture Capital start up come to us and after after we do a due diligence, if we are interested, we're gonna invest in the in that startup. Second one is venture builder. Venture builder is uh, it's a little different from venture capital. So usually in venture builder, the idea came from us, and after that we're gonna found the founder and the teams that we're looking for that is uh, capable of managing the startup that that we're gonna build. The third one is research center. So the research center is usually we're developing a new product. And usually we collaborating with universities. One of the example is Artificial Intelligence Research Center. So we collaborate with University of Indonesia. Uh, you, you, can, you can also check the site uh, at IT, Artificial Intelligence Research Center, Indonesia. So what we're looking for in startup is usually uh, we divide it into five pillars. The first one is integrity. Uh, we believe the founders with strong, uh, with strong integrity to their startups. <clears throat> And also uh, the founder that is uh, already seasoned in their fields. Second one is uh, market potential. Third one is innovation. Innovation that can disrupt conventional businesses. Uh, fourth one is impact. Startup that is impactful to the others and Indonesia, of course. And the fifth one and the most important one is the collaboration. Because we are a corporate venture capital, we are looking for collaboration between uh, UMG Myanmar itself and also our portfolio. So our portfolio so far, uh, there's like 60 companies that we invested uh, around the world. And most of all, like 30%, like 50% of them, 30 companies uh, are actually in Indonesia. And we already disbursed around 28 million US dollars. We have portfolio in China, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Our ticket size ranging from 50k until 1 mil, 1 million US dollars. So we we usually invest at stage of pre seed, seed until pre A. We cannot invest in Series A and above because it's already saturated anyway. So uh, our deal flow process is usually like this: the first one is pitching, startup come to us, and after that, after we interested in that startup, we negotiate the valuation, and after the valuation is uh, is achieved. Uh, the number is achieved. We move to the term sheet and legal agreement, and after the, after all of that, uh, we're gonna uh, the closing one. We we're gonna deploy the our investment.
So why do we invest in Indonesia? The first one is of course rapid investment growth. Uh, this is data from Google 27. It's like 70. Uh, that's like 64 four time multiples. And of course, Indonesia is also a leading digital population. We're the number one digital population in ASEAN, and globally, we're on number fifth. Emerging market, uh, GDP, GDP in Indonesia because we're like still developing country. It's 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 develop it's developing quite huge. And the last one, but not the least, is tax savvy because Indonesia, uh, every Indonesian is actually already already. Uh, already can use technology uh, so far without without any difficulties. These are our portfolio in Indonesia. Uh, I mean, uh, if you want to collaborate with UMG Adelab or or even for our portfolio, you can contact me. There's like Crowdy. Crowdy is peer to peer lending in agricultural industry. There's Aruna. Aruna is fishery commerce. There's like thirty in this, so I can, I cannot tell you one by one. So you can just uh, look at it. There's Legalku. The uh, legal we invested in Legalku in January actually. The our latest our latest investment is Legalku and Spara. Yeah, you can look at it. Cash it. There's like video analytic. This analytic to identify and understand audiences using social media and also uh, artificial intelligence research center uh, the one that i told you earlier that uh, we have collaboration with university of indonesia so if you got any pitch deck or want to collaborate please don't be shy to contact me in uh, lutfi at umgidlab.id we still uh, we're still looking for startup and We'll, we're, we're, still, uh, we're still looking to invest even in these trying times. Okay, I think that's all for me. Uh, the next presentation will be presented by Ventura Discoveries. Michelle, I'm gonna give the screen time to you. Michelle, okay. are you ready now? Yes, I am. Okay then, go ahead, Michelle. Nah, terima kasih perkenalannya Lutfi. Um, perkenalkan nama saya Michelle. Uh, maaf. Perkenalkan nama saya Michelle, Partnership Manager dari Venture Discovery. Terima kasih untuk teman-teman yang sudah meluangkan waktu kalian untuk hari di sini. Nah, saya ingin memberikan sedikit introduction tentang Venture Discovery. Venture Capital is an early stage VC firm investing in the leading high growth tech companies in Southeast Asia. Nah, pada saat ini kami memiliki dua fund. Uh, fund pertama adalah Venture Capital yang didirikan tahun 2015. Fokusnya adalah pada startup seri A ke atas. Dan fund kedua kami adalah Venture Discovery yang didirikan tahun 2018, fokusnya adalah pada seed investments. Dan tiga size venture discovery dari 2000 sampai 5000 US dollar. Nah, saat ini kami memiliki 29 portfolio yang terletak di tujuh negara. Venture discovery sendiri memiliki 8 portfolio, 4 di Indonesia, 2 di Singapura, dan 2 di Vietnam. Nah, ini adalah investment kami. Uh, we've invested in Wang Guru, Sociola, Zilingo, Grab, Fabelio, Ekrut, Medigo, dan lain-lainnya. Nah, tim kami dipimpin oleh John Riyadi, managing partner kami. Beliau juga adalah CEO dari Lipo Group. Lalu ada Rudy Ramawi, managing partner. Uh, beliau adalah founding CEO Google Indonesia saat mereka pertama buka kantor pada tahun 2011 lalu. Lalu ada partner kami, Raditya Pramana, yang sudah lama ada di dalam dunia venture capital dan berpesan pengalaman di dalam ekosistem startup ini. Sekian perkenalan dari saya. Untuk informasi lebih lanjut, silakan kunjungi website kami, venture.com, dan kalian juga bisa masukkan pitch deck kalian di website kami. Terima kasih.
Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, uh, the next presentation will be presented by Plug and Play. So, Iren, are you ready now? Uh, yes. Okay, then. I'm going to give the screen time to you then. Okay. Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to today's intro session. Trust your well. My name is Irene as one of the venture team here in GK Plug and Play Indonesia. Uh, before going to the main event today, please let me introduce GK Plug and Play and what we have built so far in Indonesia ecosystem in a few slides after this. So we are based in Silicon Valley uh, and Plug and Play journey started as an early investor group of big names such as Google, PayPal, Danger, and Logitech. With that in mind, Plug and Play was also widely known as a global innovation platform as we connect the world's change makers in one ultimate ecosystem. In this ecosystem itself, Plug and Play have partnered with corporations and acted as the bridge between these corporates and startups all over the world. Plug and Play helps corporations to innovate through our startups while startups can fill up the gap with amazing solutions and innovations. So here is the summarize of what we do in Plug and Play, described in three main pillars of innovation. Of the first pillar, Exeter program, we run over 50 programs a year in most countries in the globe. And also in this program, we uh, help to accelerate our startup portfolio to gain more tractions, meaningful connections, and meeting the right mentors. Of the second pillar, corporate innovation platform, we connect startups with our corporate partners, providing them the opportunity to do pilots of projects, proof of concepts, uh, through what we call a steel flow station. And last but not the least, we also do invest and co-invest with our investor partners as we believe in the quality of our startup portfolio as a venture capital. I also want to highlight here that we are the only accelerator program that was invited directly by President Joko Widodo from Silicon Valley that I will explain later more on. And we are also specialized in our corporate innovation platform to connect startups directly with our corporate partners that makes us a unique accelerator program and also as a VC as well. Here is a summary of our global ecosystem for startups, where we act as a bridge to engage startups to be powered up by our passionate experts for mentorships, VC partners for a better chance funding and investment, industry experts, strategic partners, governments, universities and alumni connections, and most importantly with corporations. Plug and Play has been connected and be a part of more than 300 corporations' innovative journey around the world. And we also have been a part of many startup success stories, even in late 2019. We, has been, we have been involved in, with eight unicorns and even more now, with each more than one billion US dollar valuation. Plug and Play was first started the journey in Silicon Valley, as mentioned before and currently have empowered more than 28 offices located in many countries across the globe. Other Asia regional offices, including Singapore as the headquarter office for Asia Pacific, Thailand, Philippines, China, Japan, and Jakarta. And here is a little bit of our history that explains, that explains our entity here in Indonesia starting from Plug and Play itself in 2006. We started to give big impact to the startup world and corporations. And our entity here is unique compared to other Plug and Play branches in other countries because we are supported by Gun Consolindo or GK that was established in 2012. GK is a local strategic business advisory and investment alliance that also bridges our path from Silicon Valley to Indonesia. And finally, in 2016, GK and Plug and Play worked together as GK Plug and Play Indonesia joint venture 
to invest in startups through our accelerator program. Here is more story on how Mr. Joko Widodo brought plug and play from Silicon Valley to Indonesia. It all started from Mr. Joko Widodo's visit to Silicon Valley on February 2016 and saw that plug and play vision created a big impact on the technology world. Therefore, he thought that plug and play can improve local startup ecosystem as well as overall economic growth. This is a snapshot of our founder, CEO Saida Midi, in Mr. Joko Widodo's President Palace on December 2016, where he came to Jakarta and celebrated our soft launching as a response from Mr. Joko Widodo's personal invitation. On April 2017, we held our first expo with our partners Astra, BNI, BTN, and Sinarmas. Fast forward on November 2019, we have also started our partnerships with Puma, ITM, and BCA. By then, we have accelerated more than 65 startups, and as of today, we have accelerated more than 80 startups throughout the program. This is a summary of what we have built so far in Indonesia, and as I've mentioned before, these are the benefits when startups join and expose to our ultimate ecosystem. We provide startups to grow as you open up meaningful connections for startups to universities, alumni community for talent hiring my friends, mentors and passionate experts for mentoring and workshops, VC partners for investment opportunity, governments and regulators, media and tech communities for branding, logistical supports and great deals for co-working space rent, and most importantly, connections with our seven corporate partners, Astra, BNI, BCA, ITM, Huma, BTN, and Sinarmas. We are running two batches of accelerator program every year. Currently, we are finished with our batch six program and starting our batch seven soon. We have done more than 25 investments so far and partnered with seven corporate partners as mentioned before. And for the program, so far we are focusing on FinTech and InsureTech, Food and Agri, Mobility and IoT. However, we are, we are a vertical agnostic program and a venture capital in which mostly looking for startups that at least already have an MVP stage product that will be launched soon in the market. There, these are our startup portfolio in Indonesia, simplified into, into these three categories. Some of you must have been heard about Soya Box, right? E-commerce uh, e platform to connect farmers directly with customers to increase their income. Soya Box is one of our best portfolio from food and agri-tech. In fintech, we also have Halovina and Gandeng Tangan for logistic and supply chain categorized in Industry 4.0, we have Trukita, one of the biggest marketplace for trucking services, and also other startups in Enterprise 4.0 verticals. The following slides are the snapshots of our accelerator program activities, including all the benefits that can be uh, through the, throughout the program. In terms of investment, we mostly do invest or co-invest in seed round for a few startups only uh, in, in the program. In the program, for logistical support, we provide limited co-working space for three months program. And throughout the program, there will be workshop session, mentor matchmaking session, and mentoring session, weekly startup assessment to assess startup goals, and also pitch practices. A few networking sessions will also be done where startups can connect directly with industry experts, corporate partners, and regulators. These are snapshots of deal flow session that is done where startups pitch directly and engage with our corporate partners for opportunity to do pilots, POC, or even investment. VC networking session through our VC speed dating event will also be done where startups are matchmaked with our VC partners for funding and investment opportunity. Expo day as the end of the three months program where startups will pitch in front of bigger audience, including medias, communities, investors, corporations, and other public. Currently we are now closing our 
batch seven applications for our Exota program. However, if you're a star, if you're a startup interested to join our ecosystem, you can still register here in the link bit.ly pnp batch seven. Latest until tomorrow this week before we of we, before we officially close the application. These are next events on June 10th with check in though. And also on June 17th with contractmo.com. You can register on Eventbrite. If you have any questions for our upcoming event, you can also contact my colleague here, Fortuna, as a community and partnership manager. And also follow, uh, follow our social media on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or our website. So that's it from me. Thank you for listening through. I will pass it back to Lutfi to continue the event today. Okay, thank you very much, Irene. That is very true presentation. That is very nice. <laughs> okay, uh, the, next the next presentation, but certainly not the least, there's an uh, introduction from Alpha Momentum Indonesia. Uh, Rina, are you ready? Yes, Lutfi. Okay, I'm gonna give the screen time to you then. Okay, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining our startup clinic uh, today. And uh, in this time, I want to introduce you about Open Momentum Indonesia. Uh, my name is Yusrina. I'm one of the event lead in Open Momentum Indonesia. So, so uh, Apple Momentum Indonesia is a corporate venture capital. We are started in January 2018. We are an Indonesia-based corporate venture capital. We we actually bridging, connecting, and facilitating direct investment between our clients and startups. But besides this, uh, this my, our main focus. We also trying to build a startup ecosystem in Indonesia through events and also through other online activations. And sorry. And next, uh, this is our values. We really valued uh, entrepreneurship and community and innovation when we are trying to search uh, a new startup for us to invest. And this is uh, the type of uh, things that we can, how we can help uh, the startups. So we can help the startup uh, through digital technology and IT infrastructure. As I mentioned before, uh, we are a corporate venture capital. We are actually uh, uh, in, a, in a group with IT big company in Indonesia. So for digital technology and IT infrastructure, it, we have connection to it. So this is the type, of, the type of thing that we can help for the startup that join to us. And the next one is business network. We also have a large business network within our community. And the next one is access to investors and corporates in one, in one platform. And uh, these are the type of startups that we are really interested in. Uh, the first one is payments and financial services. Next one, consumer commerce, artificial intelligence, education technology, digital healthcare, blockchain, and advertising technology. And actually any kind of industry, we are really open. Uh, as long as the startup is using a really innovative and unique technology, we are really open for, for it. And this is the, uh, the activity that we actually select the startups before we want to invest them. We have Pitch Day. Pitch Day is an annual uh, event for our monthly event. So we uh, curate startups for this pitch days and after that we introduce them to our investors and board of board of directors uh, after that we will decide uh, whether we want to invest in the startup or not and the next one is uh, our we also have a investor network so within this uh, Alpha momentum we we also have a large investor network and uh, 
because we created startups and put the best startups into our pipeline of the month and this pipeline will be sent out to our community of investors so it will be a win-win solution for the startup itself and the next one is our funding portfolio since 2019 uh, this is the sixth startup that we already invested and the first one is the edx asia next one anantarupa studio digital exchange ikigai liquid and ayu indonesia as you can see that these are really various in this industry so no matter it, uh we we don't really uh select uh to focus to into selected industry we are open to any kind of industry and startups okay the, the, the next one this is our events uh, the first one we have start upgrade this is a workshop for start early startup founders we usually help start upgrade uh, offline in co-working space but for because of this pandemic we actually uh, postpone these events and we are turn it, turn it to into online webinar and the next one is Trackers day is a panel discussion between startup founders and alpha kickstart is a actually uh just like startup grid a workshop but more uh it's a paid uh, workshop, so it is really uh, more focused to the material itself. And the next one is pitch data, just like I have mentioned before. And uh, because of that, uh, we are also open for collaboration, partnership, and consulting events within our startup community. So if you want to join our event or want to partner with us, we are really open for that. You can just email us or contact us via our social media, uh, through Instagram, LinkedIn, or email. Okay, next one is uh, because we curate startups every month, that's why we need uh, new startups every month. If you are a new startup, uh, you can submit your pitch deck here this is the link you can uh, write it down and you can submit your pitch deck and later on if you are interested we will in, we will uh, contact you later and next one this is uh, our current partners we uh, already partner with some of big brands like microsoft alibaba cloud and aws and uh, the rest of them is mostly accelerator and also co-working space and also university explorators. And the last one, we, I just want to uh, tell you about our next webinar with one of our portfolio, which is Anantarupa Studio. Anantarupa Studio is a local game developer and uh, she will be sharing about Indonesia game indus industry as their perspective. So uh, if you if you interested with this kind of industry please join and this, uh, you can check our instagram for the link okay that's it for uh from alpha momentum you can contact us via email via our social media and we are really open for uh, partnership and collaboration and other activities that we can do together okay thank you for uh for your attention i will give the screen back to Lutfi. Okay, thank you very much, Rina. Thank you for that presentation. So, uh, without further ado, let's move to the main event. Uh, that the reason that you guys attending this event, <laughs> uh, Q and A with venture capitals. So the the presenters are David from Angin, Pizar from Cal Calibra, Michelle from Skystar, and it will be moderated by uh, Melissa from Plug and Play Indonesia. So I'm just gonna give my screen time to Melissa. Melissa, are you ready? to start the Q&A session. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you, Lutfi. Okay, then. So, hi, everyone, depending upon where you are. Good morning, afternoon, uh, evening, everyone. I am Melissa Alim, a VP of Corporate Innovation at GK Plug and Play Indonesia. I'm so excited today. Uh, here with me, I have three speakers. Uh, I want to introduce Tizar Firmansha, a partner of Calibra Capital. Hello, Tizar. And we have David Sokshing, uh, Managing Director of Angin, and also Michelle Irawan, Principal of Skystar Capital. So our uh, startup clinic topic today uh, is, is it a good idea to raise during COVID-19? The format will be 30 minutes discussion and 30 minutes uh, questions and answer. 
So as we know, uh, in general, um, the topic is very general and broad, uh, but today we are going to dig deeper about that because um, as you guys know, COVID-19 uh, uh, overall, uh, business are slowing down, economy are slowing down, but then uh, on the other side, there are disruptive technology startups that are actually accelerating um, uh, and uh, during this COVID-19 situation. So we're going to ask uh, our speaker's opinion about that. We're going to discuss also about the, their priorities during this time and probably for them to share some of their portfolio startups. And also we will talk about insights uh, post COVID-19. Uh, before we start the discussion, I would like to um, ask our speakers to share a few words about uh, your VC and at which stage uh, in terms of funding are you at? Maybe you can start with uh, David. Yes, good, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so actually it's funny because we are, we are not a VC actually and we are very clear because we are not structured as a fund. We are actually quite close to Alpha Momentum the way we work. So our role at Anion is to connect investors, mostly individuals, to investment opportunities, right? And sometimes what we do is we represent the investors or we represent the startup. So meaning that our investors have a target, they, reach, they want to reach out to a certain type of startup or entrepreneurs, like in a very specific niche or specific type of industry, and we help to look for them. And we accompany them around the investment process. And on the other hand, we got startup coming to us, raising um, a certain amount of funding, and we help them to uh, get money from investors. So we usually focus on what we call pre-seed and seed stage. So the minimum we will do will be 25K US dollar. So let's say 300, 350 million uh, juta. And the maximum we do usually is half a million dollar, considering it's quite a stretch. And what we call a sweet spot, so what we are very comfortable with would be the perfect deal for us is 100, 150K US dollar. That's something we are used to. We know how to do that properly fast. Um, yeah. And I think the last point is we are not only looking at technology startup because we invested over time in very traditional businesses that could be um, you know, food and beverage related to waste management or to agriculture. So it doesn't have to be technology with us. Okay, thank you, David. How about uh, Tizar? Yeah, hi, Melissa. Uh, so I just want to introduce about the uh, Polybra Capital. Uh, I co-founded this PC uh, uh, three years ago together with uh, Leon and uh, uh, Leon is actually the co-founder of Topopedia.com and Nara is from Jupitra uh, Property Group. So the idea for uh, Polybra was actually to collaborate with a portfolio company with the founders, because when we set up the uh, uh, our fund, we have been actually active investing in startup ourselves as on a personal basis. And what we discover actually uh, for any uh, startup to grow, uh, other than money, they actually need uh, collaboration more with uh, the investors themselves. How to brainstorm together? I mean, to because. Uh, uh, Money is easy to find, uh, but then the most difficult one is actually how to brainstorm together and collaborate in order to grow your company. In terms of like strategy, we uh, uh, in, uh, at the beginnings uh, focus in Series A. We were opportunistic in uh, pre-Series A and also Series B. But then now uh, with this COVID, we have we are actually expanded our horizon. We open uh, opportunities uh, above Series B as well. And in terms of the uh, 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 coverage, uh, we are agnostic in terms of industry. Uh, we could invest uh, anywhere around the world as long as the company are willing to expand or to uh, grow the, uh, the business in Indonesia. Because, so that, that's why we can collaborate together uh, with them. And uh, in terms of like uh, ticket size, uh, so far the lowest ticket size that we have wrote, uh, written is about uh, 100,000 and the biggest ticket size we have written is 1.5 million. Yeah, thanks. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Tizar. How about Michelle? Hi, uh, yeah, so I guess a little bit of background about SkyStar. We were established in 2014 um, locally uh, here in Indonesia. Uh, so, so far throughout this uh, six years almost, um, we have invested in about 31 companies. Uh, we have successfully exited four of them uh, and 26 of them uh, are still active at the moment. Uh, in terms of sector, pretty much the same with Calibra, we're pretty sector agnostic. Um, and stage, we focus on early stage startups. So ticket size between 300K up to 2 million. Um, yeah, and we're still look, uh, actively looking for investments right now. Uh, our, I guess our differentiation point is that we're supported by local uh, group. Um, so we have Saratoga and uh, Compass Remedia as our backers. So, uh, you know, any, any so sectors we will be able to value add somehow uh, here in Indonesia. See, okay, thank you, Michelle. So, um, I would like to open this discussion with actually talking about the current situation, like actually M Michelle already mentioned. So, I wanted to ask uh, Are you guys still actively looking to invest in startups during this time? Uh, if yes, which sectors uh, and why? Maybe uh, who wants to start first? Maybe, Michelle, you want to continue what you've uh, shared before? Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, I guess this short answer is yes. Um, yes, we're still looking at, at, at investments. Uh, we're still actively looking at investments. Although that being said, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure other uh, my other fellow colleagues will, will agree that we, will, we are more cautious um, and will take more time uh, in, in terms of like finding the right startup just because I think um, this pandemic will change the way we do things uh, across all industries. Uh, and I think figuring out how uh, and which industry will thrive and then which industry will not continue to uh, grow uh, is something that we all are figuring out. Um, so I think, you know, like we always think about which sector will thrive after this pandemic season. Yeah. Okay, and how about Tizar? Yeah, actually, uh, during this pandemic, uh, we are very active again in, in uh, looking for uh, the right investment. Actually, we look at this situation as, as, uh, as uh, actually a blessing in disguise for a startup because uh, at this point, uh, not only startup is having difficulty to grow the business, but also the uh, uh, conglomerates. Uh, so uh, in terms of the uh, competition, uh, this kind of situation actually leveling the playing ground right now. So uh, of course, uh, the problem is right now uh, when we invest, uh, we we still look for the fundamental. We look for the company that generates revenue. Not only uh, from the very beginning, we, we don't really focus on company that just focus on growth in terms of GMV, but we really focus on the fundamental. Yeah. Okay, uh, on, on your side, David? Yeah, I mean, uh, almost the same answer, right? I would say we focus on two things, both is new investment, and we actually chose two new investments over the last two months. And also to share, because people don't necessarily know that, but we're actually also a startup ourselves. So we even fundraise for ourselves in the middle of the crisis. So we fundraise for Anil as an entity, because we have also VC on our uh, cap table. So for instance, five and a startup is one of my shareholders. And so we raised from an investor in Singapore. Um, and then we also raised for two companies. And the big focus for us is to help companies we have supported so far. Because over the last five years, we have invested in 62 organizations, all Indonesian. So all of them need support, right? That could be to extend their, their runway, to actually be able to pivot. So the work right now is to provide additional funding if needed, or to actually help them to pass through the crisis uh, that could be through mentoring, access to network, knowledge, resources, etc. Yeah, so we did, and I guess it's the same. I think as Tisa, we also reshape the way, the way uh, we see things. Things take a bit longer, obviously. Uh, it's not as conducive as, as before, especially when it comes to certain type of business, when you need to see, to see things on the ground, like due diligence and so on, it takes more time. But I guess I think that's more or less what all the investors will tell you is like they are still open, but yeah, there is a bit more friction, right? Uh, so you expect more delays and a bit of change of mindset as well. Not a bit, actually quite a change of mindset uh, around the way people see, see businesses. I see. So, um, and if not funding, um, what are your uh, 
PC priorities other than funding, probably activities. So, <coughs> so that's what I share, right? I think what mm -hmm. we see is this, this kind of situation, which we call a black swan, right? Nothing was predictable, right? It was, it hit everybody by surprise. And, and then you see actually some businesses, especially the one that were focusing on growing. So they were not profitable from a cash flow point of view. Then that's the one who actually very, uh, hit very badly, right? They might have to reshape everything, right? We are talking about businesses. We need to do a 360 pivot, pivot or to actually change industry try to reuse their asset to do something else. That's why I think they need some help because this takes actually a lot of effort, a lot of resources, and that's where founders need more than money. Actually, sometimes it's actually support. So we are not experts in all domain, but we have access to resources and that's how we try to connect them. Um, I would say second one is also just also be able to listen, right? We see that there's a lot of demand for talking, discussing things, collaborating, cross, crossing uh, portfolios as well to see how together as a group we can do better. So that's the additional, uh, the additional part. And um, last point I think we are all also probably doing is like rethinking and reflecting on ourselves and thinking about next step, right? What would be the next move, the next industry, the net, uh, next step of founders we would love to fund. Uh, so there's a lot of also self-reflection involved in this process. Uh, Michelle or Tizar, do you want to add on to that? Think, like I mentioned um, before, um, the focus will be to find companies that, um, you know, working towards sustainable growth. Uh, I think this is the same theme that has been, you know, mentioned several times during 2019. Uh, you know, when, when there are a few failed IPOs in the U.S., I think a lot of people have been saying that, you know, not just growth, but sustainable growth. And I think this uh, COVID is just reiterating that message, right? Um, you know, like not growth at all costs. It, it's more like, you know, how to how do you defend your marketing spend? Uh, how, how do you defend all these expenses for, for the growth? And I think, like David mentioned, um, you know, the adoption to the new normal, I think that's something that we need to work together with our funders, uh, you know, stress testing um, your financials and, and making sure that you find a new business strategy that will adapt to this new condition. Yeah, from our end, uh, in addition to what uh, David and actually uh, 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 have mentioned, and uh, it, we also look at the uh, um, what do you call it, how the uh, this company react with uh, the changes and the new normal in the, in the market. So uh, we don't want them to be just so reactive. Uh, because right now uh, we see that so many people are turning into uh, selling hand sanitizer, for example. That's a it's, it's a reaction, but it is not yeah. a sustainable uh, growth. <laughs> and so sanitizer want, and mask. Want, yes, exactly. So uh, uh, we want to uh, uh, the company to innovate. They they have to be able to innovate to survive. But then the, the, the idea, but then it has to be sustainable too, as what Michelle already mentioned. So, uh, and this, the innovation adaptability is actually the most important thing. And the very at the very beginning, uh, we also uh, check with them about the, uh, how to uh, monetize it. So again, it's about the revenue, again, it's about the bottom line. So uh, from the very, maybe we are different from many other PC, we, we really focus on that. We always check on, how you they make money, bring revenue to the company? Because at this point, uh, cash is king. Uh, cash is king. So they should uh, be able to uh, uh, have a lot of a long, a longer runway. Uh, just uh, and because uh, whoever can survive longer, they will, they will uh, be, uh, they will be at the better position. Yeah, uh, I would agree with you guys. Uh, and since um, you guys mentioned about the runway, uh, in your guys' opinion, uh, what do you think is the ideal cash position or runway that startups need to have in this kind of situation? Um, maybe I just, uh, just continue about that. So uh, I actually advise uh, all our portfolio company to, to have a better runway about uh, 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 at a uh, minimum one year, but then uh, it, it is better to have at least two years. 
Why? Because as I said, uh, this situation is uh, unknown for everyone. It's uh, unknown for the conglomerates, unknown for the startup. So, and again, cash is king. And at this point, uh, we should be able to adapt. But then, as uh, when whenever we adapt, we always have to do a trial and error. So the first uh, strategy might not be successful, and we have to try out, try out another strategy again. And and why uh, two years? So then you have a lot of uh, time uh, to to make sure that you can uh, deliver return, uh, revenue, uh, performance to 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 brag in, in, in front of the uh, uh, future investor. Uh, so, so that's why I say the longer the better. But then, of course, uh, it depends on the business itself. But that's just my generic uh, uh, opinion. Okay, thank you, Tizar. How about uh, Michelle or David? Do you want to? Um, I think it's the same. Um, I think I I also ask my founders to try to extend it at least eighteen months. That's what I always say. Um, why eighteen months? I think. It's a simple answer. Uh, I think they are forecasting that they'll get a um, vaccine for COVID at the end of 2021. So 18 months, I think it's a safe bet. Uh, but I think like, you know, the longer the better, right? Um, and that's what we're trying to do with a lot of our founders to stress test their expenses. Um, you know, making sure that, you know, if the like, revenue comes down, right? If people are like losing jobs um, and they will stop spending on consumer products, for example, um, you know, if your sales go down by 50%, 70%, how long will you last? Um, and I think making sure that you know a few like eighteen months is is the best is the best that we can do right now. Okay, um, David, do you think the same too? I mean, yes, nothing much to add. Uh, I think when it comes to runway, right, it's the money you have on your bank account, right. So I think that's not only the money you receive. So it's thinking about how your clients' flow will go down, but also the money you spend, right. So I think the question is, so it's, it's always easy to say, look, you should extend your runway, but it's not always possible for any companies when you have also this conception of fixed costs and variable costs, right? So we have some companies, for instance, where we have fixed costs. For instance, they have, to, they have rented a place that, you know, they have a lease that is already paid, like restaurants. You know, we have a company called Burgreens that operate out of mall and they have their own restaurant, right? They can actually probably decrease their, their some of their variable costs. They can, you know, let let go some of the sales team, reduce a bit the operation hours, put people on leaves, etc. But then there's a notion of fixed cost that they still need to to cover, right? The lease, etc. So I think that's also depending on the uh, the answer. And also, ideally, yes, you expand to as much as you can. Um, but in reality, it's not it's not easy for everybody, right? Yes, yeah, true. That's true. Uh, can you guys maybe share, um, tell us about one of your startup experience in your portfolio? Uh, do they have to pivot or how do they persevere during this time? I mean, I can continue. So I was mentioning Burgreens, right? Which is yes, a, you, a you eatery, mentioned. right? So initially, basically, most of their sales were done on site, right? Offline sales, people going to their restaurant. And yes, they were selling through Gojek, uh, GoFood, right? So probably it was 80% offline, 20% online. Then the virus hit and a lot of malls closed down. So they have actually to close uh, by, um, by logic their, their stores, right? So as any uh, FNB, they, they lost more than 70% of their sales. And it was not as bad as some firm like Union Group or Ismaya, which is 80 to 90% losses. Then they have to rethink what, what can we do, right? Um, so then they started to sh shift a bit more to online sales, which involves also it's a new way of doing business, it's a new logistic, it's a new also channel, trying to push then all the promotion they were doing offline at the restaurant to move it online. So increasing a bit the digital marketing aspect, et cetera. And we also try also to think how people now consume. So we also produce um, frozen food, right? And also see the the opportunity in this crisis where people focus more on their health, their stamina actually to promote more of this aspect uh, around their product, right? But eating alternative protein is healthier, it builds up your, resist, or your, uh, resist, your health system, etc. Um, so actually sort of to 
go back as fast as possible to the level of sales they were before, which is not going to happen soon, but at least they managed to, to pass. And that's why I think Tisa was mentioning, this is the type of reaction we expect from founders because that give us even more faith that actually they, they are very good founders and good managers. So actually they are fundraising at the moment. We got very strong commitment from VC and impact investors and also our own angels reinvested actually to also support them during the, the situation. So look, nothing is, is negative, right? In the middle of the crisis, probably the worst business to have ever, it's a restaurant at the moment, and they still manage to fundraise, share their business model and continue growing without actually minim with minimizing all the, you know, the firing, losses, etc. Yes, that, that is a real good example, uh, David. Thank you. How about from Tizar? Yeah, hi. Maybe because uh, maybe lots of audience here are from Indonesia. I share about my Indonesian portfolio. Uh, mm -hmm. We invested in Travelio. It is, uh, they are actually in a very difficult uh, market right now, uh, property market. Uh, uh, as you have seen, many hotels actually closed down and they actually provide uh, the uh, full service uh, uh, platform for uh, property owner who want to uh, lease out the uh, property and also it's like Airbnb but full service. Uh, the, uh, and the good thing about uh, uh, Travelio at, at this point, I see that many of the competitors actually uh, are gone one by one. I, I see like for example Oyo, Red Doors and uh, uh, Airy, uh, they are not in a good position anymore. Uh, but then the, uh, for uh, Travelio, at this time, they are be able to adapt and, and uh, also innovate. How they adapt? They actually worked uh, uh, side by side with the developer themselves uh, to do a uh, full marketing or co-branding. Uh, surprisingly, for a developer, they, they still can sell uh, products at this point in time. For example, I'm uh, Chiputra Group. Uh, uh, in a day, they could sell up to uh, the record I was I heard was one one hundred eighty seven billion rupiah in a day. So uh, uh, Travelio is making use uh, the uh, network uh, to to actually work together with the in, in the industry players. I mean to to uh, to provide uh, best solution for each other. And at the same time, they also uh, uh, try to extend uh, the uh, full service for the uh, tenants those people who stay at the uh, Travelio's uh, property. So from the, at the beginning, it was just a platform, but now they offer uh, 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 additional services like grocery services, uh, cleaning, and then uh, uh, disinfection services. So whatever you need uh, from your home, uh, they can provide uh, uh, within the platform. Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the uh, portfolio that we have uh, seen. Thank you. Uh, about Michelle? Um, yeah, I think, you know, like one of the portfolio that comes to mind is Sweet Escape. Um, I think similar to this are they're in travel uh, photography. So obviously they got hit pretty bad. Uh, you know, obviously like other, other companies in travel industries because no one is traveling, right? Uh, and no one is taking travel photography. Um, so recently I figured that they, they um, established new products. So Fitball Shoot and Terrace Mini Photo Shoot. Uh, you know, like as people, as everyone is currently stuck at home and spending more and more family time, uh, I think, you know, a lot of people want to commemorate this moment as well. You know, like uh, when their little ones are growing up, um, they want to take pictures in front of their house. Um, so they're doing like, um, you know, in front of your home photo shoot with, with the, the family. Um, and they also do virtual shoot. Um, so a lot of, a lot of people are currently, you know, it's, it's trending right now to do virtual shoot. Um, like David mentioned, um, these are the things that uh, come with, the grit of the founders, right? Not giving up just because, you know, your first idea got hit by this pandemic doesn't mean that, you know, there's no branch out of the initial idea of still photography, uh, but maybe not the travel. Um, so, so this kind of grit is something that we're looking for from the founders, um, you know, being able to come up with new ways of doing business that can adapt to this uh, condition, right? Yes. Um... So um, I would like to ask maybe uh, another questions. Um, 
So during this crisis, uh, what are the risks? And maybe we can start with, uh, we, Michelle, you can just continue. Um, what are the risks in fundraising? Yeah, yeah, during this time. Um, like I can mention, because I think something. timing. Yeah, I think timing. Uh, people are taking their time uh, in doing due diligence. Uh, and I think a lot of founders, uh, they sometimes misunder, like underestimate the, the time that they, they will have to spend uh, waiting for the investors to give the commitment. Uh, it can take up to a few months, guys. So sometimes, like, I think this is the biggest risk. Uh, they only have, for example, five months runway, and then the fundraising is taking, you know, four or five months. Um, and they will end up with, like, very little runway and um, and then at the end of the due diligence process the investors decided that they cannot invest uh, and, and they're in a position a very hard position that they will have to raise a uh, bridge from their existing investors or, or if they don't have um, existing investors that can support them then they have to uh, you know liquidate the company so I think like the risk is time um, that's why I always tell my founders um, you know extend the runway as much as possible so that you know, when you fundraise, uh, you're fundraising in a position of strength. Uh, you know, you're not desperate because your runway is very limited, uh, but you are in a position of strength that you can, you know, you can wait. Even the founders, uh, the the investors are taking their time. Uh, you still have enough runway to to survive. Yeah. So the biggest risk I think is time. Okay. So um, how about um, David? Um, yeah, I mean, timing for sure. I would say um, it's maybe anecdotal, but we see, you know, the bargaining power has changed a little bit, right? Because now people know that VC are taking more time, investors are more risk, um, risk averse, etc. So I would say I see two things is, um, I've, and it, it happened two or three times recently. So I don't know if it's a pattern, but I see valuation going down and basically founders, investors taking advantage and saying, look, Money is rare, you don't have much choice, so you take these valuations, you say take it or leave it. So they use the crisis actually to put down the valuation, which sometimes makes sense, but sometimes it's also not necessarily related. It's just an opportunity for investors to do that. Um, so I would say this, be careful about this. Um, that's probably a bad sign that the investor is not the right one you want to get on board. Um, and I will say there is still a lot of, um, I think that's also the responsibility of us as investors to be clear. Are we still investing or not? because I also see a lot of people going around with pretending they are investing, but they are not, uh, because they want to maintain their, their sort of face on, on the industry, right? But technically, they sometimes don't have money, they don't have a mandate to invest anymore, so they are wasting founders' time. So actually, be careful as, as an entrepreneur, uh, do also your due diligence and be clear with the investors, are you investing? If yes, how, what time of timing are we talking about? Because if you're expecting to get the money right now because you are in a short-term, runaway crisis then, and you are talking to someone who is in a mindset that, oh, actually the money might come in December when things are getting better, then there's a total misadjustment and you are wasting precious time. So that's the two risk, right? Valuation going down for no reason. Uh, so actually you need to have a very clear, um, I think, process around it. And the second one is wasting time with people with no money. Yes, I see. Thank you, David. How about uh, Tizar? Yeah. Uh, so for for uh, for, for me, uh, the the risk actually there are two main risks. First is actually, uh, uh, I mean, why you want to fundraise at this point in time? If your if your cash runway is only like six months, I mean, it it shows the urgency why. But then uh, you if if. At that situation, uh, normally founders, uh, they at, especially at this time, they should stay confident and they should have prepared a plan about how to maneuver the situation well. So they shouldn't just uh, uh, fundraise as if the, the situation was, uh, is uh, as normal as last year. The situation has been different, so they should know uh, the uh, 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 what uh, the investors are looking for. The second thing is actually the uh, the valuation itself. So uh, I think in the past, uh, many uh, many many companies are valued at a very high valuation. And at this point, uh, 
uh, I, again, I, I think there must be a, a correlation between a performance and evaluation. So we have been actually doing for the past uh, one year or six months, and what will be the plan for the next one year or two years, and then that should actually relate to the valuation that they ask. Because if the valuation is too high, then at this point, uh, the investors are actually uh, comparing the uh, uh, several, many other companies at the same time. And they will just look at the, the cheapest and then also the, uh, the, the, the one that has the biggest prospect. So uh, again, so there are only two things. One is actually be prepared for uh, the strategy and also the second one, the valuation. Thank you. Thank you, Tizar. So uh, I just want to remind the audience, if you guys have any questions, don't forget to type in the chat box before the session ends. And I just want to continue that. Um, there's this questions, um, how important coffee talk is and how long should we be doing that before our actual, our actual pitch in times like this and uh, how to set up a coffee talk with them. And maybe uh, you guys can add what advice, what other advice would you give to the startups whose demand has suddenly dropped near to nothing due to the coffee? Other than you guys already giving some advice earlier. Hey, was, what was the first question? Sorry, I lost it. So uh, one of the audience asked um, mm -hmm. how important coffee talk is and how long should we be doing that before our actual pitch in times like this? And how coffee, to set up a coffee talk? Coffee talk Maybe in a, in a, a sense there of, like dating an investor or like a... I think so. It's like pre, I, um, pre talk. You know, you know, at the end of the day, look, pitching is not only presenting something, right? I think mm -hmm. uh, pitching is it's a relationship, right? You are basically introduce yourself first as a as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as someone you want to be respected for, and you are presenting your idea and in investment opportunity, and both are very related. So actually, pitching is everything, right? Um, I remember I went to this event and the founder, one of the founder was not pitching per se, was talking to me, but he was not pleasant actually the way he was engaging with the ecosystem. He was very laborious and very arrogant. Then the next day he came to us in pitch and said, look, actually I see you in a different manner right now. So even before pitching, I already have certain, um, certain opinion about who you are and so on. So I think um, that's what matters. Uh, engaging with someone before pitching is important because you also you know, build relationship and so on. So I don't think there's a disconnect. Coffee talk is actually pitching as well. You're just, uh, but you're not pitching necessarily the ID. You are also exchanging and so on. So I, I think some of the best founders I've met, you know, they came to us, they said, look, I'm building this company. Don't take it as a pitch. I'm here to hear your feedback, to also understand what you think, getting maybe some contacts and connections. But it was not pitching like hardly, right? Uh, but then actually we went to a regular fundraising process and he never pitched. I actually never seen the deck per se. Um, when I fundraised from 500 startup, I don't think I even sent a deck actually. I engaged with Kaylee, the managing partners. We discussed so many times and at one point he pulled the trigger and said, hey, let's, let's make it happen. I never presented slides. Um, so I think that's also something we need to demystify this famous pitching session. It's not as mechanical actually. Um, Yeah. I see. How about um, Michelle's opinion on that? Yeah, I think I agree. Um, I think coffee, coffee talk is just coffee like well, yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's true that sometimes actually when you meet the investors in a, you know, coffee shop settings, not in a meeting room, there's like a, like, you know, it's more casual, right? So, so sometimes the, the, the barrier is like lower. Um, but I think it's more on the founder side. I think from investor side, it's, I think it's, it's, it feels the same to me. Uh, I mean, if, if you know, uh, we, we got the chemistry through meeting in person. I must say that, you know, like currently during this period, um, you know, the hardest part of, uh, of, of this doing Zoom call is, is yes. getting the chemistry. Uh, just mm -hmm. because I think in person is always better. Um, and, and I think 
regardless it's in the meeting room or in coffee shop, I think it's the same. Uh, investors can perceive and get opinion about who you are just by meeting you in person. Um, so yeah, I don't see the difference really. Okay, uh, these are, you wanna add? What was the question again? Sorry, uh, uh, Melissa. Like say, um, one of the audience asks um, how important coffee talk is during during this um, period. Because you know, I, I think maybe the reason why um, the person asks because Indonesian culture is, you know, uh, we like to do that. But then during this uh, to to increase relationship, like David and Michelle mentioned. But during this COVID, it's kind of hard to build up that relationship, or it's maybe to loosen up the the tense, I guess. Yeah. So, oh, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how 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 to do that, and how how long? Yeah. 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 So uh, during this situation, we still meet uh, with uh, new uh, founders, new company. And yeah, I, I also have found the, uh, I have to adapt with the new situation. We have a lot of Zoom meetings or Microsoft Teams. And and during this period, I guess uh, it's more structured uh, for my own experience. Uh, we do like a coffee talk, but then the, uh, that that's important because at the end of the day, uh, when we invest in the company, we invest in the person. So we, we should know you. And that's also something that, uh, we are also still learning. I mean, like how how is the best way to do the, to do that? Uh, because not normally we could we could meet in person and we could see the body language, we can see the facial expression, the tone, and everything else. Now with the technology, we have a lot of disruption. Sometimes the connection is not good, and we don't know. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, and then at the same time, when we are talking like this, uh, we got distracted by so many things. Our kids, our our spouse, our uh, our dogs, for example. So <laughs> it's something that uh, uh, difficult. So I guess uh, at this point, uh, the coffee talk can actually, uh, 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 I think, uh, in my own opinion, is still good. Uh, but then not only, not only the you should do it on a separate uh, occasion. For example, you can WhatsApp or call directly with the person, but not on the presentation, not on the pitching itself. Uh, and because from there, I think the the, uh, I think the chemistry, like Michelle said, uh, can be developed. Okay, so um, and then I want to move along. So, uh, what insights do you have about startup relation post uh, post COVID nineteen? I think some of you mentioned earlier about insights. So, um, go ahead. Go ahead, Tisa. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I, I couldn't hear the question. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. It's about the valuation. Yeah. Um, in, yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. You know, we try to be creative actually during for the valuation. So, we actually one of the deal we made, um, and we helped that way to structure the investment. Um, basically, the discussion was an engaged before the virus, right? And then the valuation was all based on future cash flow so it was all about projecting projecting what will happen and obviously things changed totally so the numbers were a bit off um, so what we did is we tell look um, it's not fair to reduce the valuation right now it would be very bad for the entrepreneurs so what we propose is let's let's give it a chance to be to the entrepreneurs to recover the sales and let's say we told we told the investor give give her two years to go back to the initial prediction uh, projection if it doesn't happen then the valuation will go down so we work on a mechanism actually but still leave an opportunity for the founders to prove that it can go back to normal right instead of going straight to decrease the valuation and have no optimism because that could be bad let's say actually the founders manage to recover then it would be actually affected by a valuation that was not reflecting what would happen so that's what we did actually um, I would say in general investors are slightly more um, I will not say stingy, but they're more careful about valuation. So I think I will say I've seen some insane valuation that was based on not so much, you know, projections, a lot of what we call a premium for the founder, you know, X background A coming from school B, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this doesn't happen that much. So we see valuation are getting more 
careful and also because we do a lot of benchmarks so by nature if everybody the valuation is going down then uh yeah it will affect everybody's valuation but the first one was actually interesting to look at um looking at sort of a variable valuation and give an opportunity to fund, uh, founders to go back to normal okay thank you david how about Cesar? Yeah, I guess in terms of valuation, uh, I mentioned earlier. So, uh, but I guess for us, uh, we focus on Series A and above. And then now we, uh, for, uh, at, from the very beginning, we are very uh, opportunistic in uh, uh, seed level or pre-Series A. So for us, uh, again, we still look at the cash flow about the revenue. Uh, what will be the actual revenue that they have done? and uh, uh, the growth and the action, the strategy that uh, actually converted into that uh, revenue. And again, also uh, the, the, the plan, the future plan. And they should be able to convince us that this plan will actually, actually convert it into the uh, projected revenue that they have done in the financial uh, plan uh, projection. So yeah, I guess back to it for us for Colibra is always uh, the fundamental back to the numbers. Yeah, we we we, we try our best to um, to uh, uh, what you call it to collaborate, but we uh, we don't live in formal uh, fear of missing out. So we 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 prefer to stay disciplined with the fundamental as long as if it is good, then we will agree at the valuation. Yeah, that they actually offer. Okay, thank you, Tizar. How about Michelle? Um, so I think in terms of valuation, right, um, in the short term, I would probably think that is a minimal impact um, just because I think most regional PCs have raised significant amount during 2019. And PCs always have like five years lifespan. So within the next few years, probably, um, I think, you know, there will still be enough dry powder in the market. Um, so, you know, as long as the company is good, I think valuation will remain the same. Um, and I think, like, some people, like, might forget about this already, but startup ecosystem, this is not the first hit. Uh, the first hit is actually major fail IPOs in the U.S. Um, and uh, it seems like this region doesn't really have any adjustment in the valuation since then. I think the valuation keeps going up. We've been going through some kind of like tech inflation. Uh, I remember when I first joined, um, you know, this industry uh, seat was like one to two million valuation. And then uh, Series A was below 10 million. And, and look at the numbers now, right? Uh, 10 million is seat now. Um, so I think, you know, the pandemic is just a, a bigger wake up call for all of us that, you know, we have to go beyond this sell to bigger fish mindset and, you know, just, just raising up valuation. But, you know, we have to build a strong business. and, and um, you know, having a business that is sustainable. Um, and I think eventually valuation will adjust and in the long term, uh, hopefully, to the real value of the business, um, to, to um, you know, businesses that have sustainable growth, uh, businesses that have strong business model. Um, I think they will still be able to raise significant amount in a justified valuation. So, yeah, I think valuation will adjust in the long term because we're in the tech bubble, guys. So, And if I add something as well, um, I can add, sorry, I think, you know, you will see also a lot of scheme, we call it convertible uh, loan, right? When actually valuation is not done today, it will be done later, right? So that's also something that we can use as well to avoid actually value, valuing rightness. Like, look, we're going to value your, com we do it a lot because we are seed investor, right? So we say, look, we're going to use the valuation next round. So let's say series A, and we're going to discount it by 20%. So the valuation we're going to take is the, the one in the future, and it's the, so that's also something to consider, right? To avoid the discussion around valuation and so on. I see. So, going back to your portfolio, do you guys invest any of the disruptive technology startups that actually, uh, or are you guys looking for a disruptive technology startups? So I can, I can answer, we haven't yet. Um, the only one we did recently, actually last week, was uh, online education. So in a sense, it's, it's not new, right? But I think the mindset of our investor was 
a lot of things will move online, especially education. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's actually sort of the crisis give more confidence about certain macroeconomic trends. Um, I would say we haven't yet, honestly, done this work of uh, where we should invest, what will be the, the next, necessarily the next move technology wise, except the big, big picture, right? Obviously, healthcare, logistics, and extra, et cetera. Uh, probably VC have done usually a harder work on this part, yeah. I see. You, you mentioned about logistic and, and actually one of our audience asked, uh, do you think logistic sector is highly popular right now among investors? Uh, what, what's your take on that? I haven't seen a lot of transactions. I would say the, uh, probably the demand is picking up, but there's already established players. So I think except if you have a very strong value proposition as a founder, uh, that's also you face also some very big guys so it really depends, right? And I think that's my take on logistics because we were the uh, first investor into cargo that also raised a lot of money. So it takes quite a lot of money right now to build a decent sized logistic company. It's very highly competitive, meaning it's even harder to, to enter, to build traction, et cetera. So I don't know. That's, that's not something I would, I would necessarily look at at the moment, even if it sounds appealing. I see. How about uh, Tizar or Michelle? At your yeah, uh, logistics has been always uh, interesting actually because uh, in Indonesia uh, we are a, a country with so many islands and then with all the uh, e-commerce volume, logistics has been very interesting. Uh, we are still opportunistic looking at this uh, uh, target at this space. Yeah. Um, so particularly on logistics, we're actually quite um, exposed already. We have uh, mm -hmm. one in truck logistics um, and the other one is in e-commerce fulfillment, which is um, tackling warehousing uh, and fulfillment. Um, so yes, we, we think that logistic will be, you know, um, will still grow, especially, you know, after COVID, um, people will be more used to like uh, online grocery shopping or, or, you know, ordering things online will be, you know, like a new normal, right? Um, so logistic companies that can cater and, and support this uh, is always needed. Uh, although the, like Cesar mentioned, it's, and, and David, it's quite fragmented, a lot of players in the market. Um, so I think that there'll be like, you know, um, there, there need to be a differentiation point. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. And, um, So we have this uh, statement, like a discussions, uh, questions from the audience. We have similar financial crisis back in 2009, which is very similar to what we are facing right now. Despite the financial crisis, uh, many successful startups have emerged and in fact thrived worldwide during that narrow period of times like Facebook, Airbnb. However, there is a different trend observed in Indonesia. Of all six unicorns uh, we currently have in Indonesia, the one with the earliest establishment date is Tokopedia, which is started in the late 2009 or post-crisis. So what do you guys think is different? Is it because of the lack of number of VCs during that time in Indonesia or other factors? And do you expect the trend to be different now, given that uh, virus is another additional consideration? Um, maybe Michelle, do you want to start first? Sorry, I don't really quite get the question. So whether or not this crisis is going to be the same with 2019, is that the question? Yeah, I guess, um, like, what, what do you think is different um, other than the financial crisis back, that, back in 2009 in okay. terms of the trend in Indonesia, like the startups trend in Indonesia? Um, so I think, yes, obviously it's different, right? Um, um, I think, you know, back in 2009, it was a crisis, um, like a financial crisis, particularly not, not, not based, based on virus. Um, so I think like a lot of people are, are they're going through a recession, the economies are going through a recession and that's why sharing economy is thriving because uh, it's just another way to, to earn money uh, with the existing property or existing, um, you know, vehicles that you have. Um, and I think this time it might not be the same um, just because, you know, sharing economy is not the answer to slowing down the virus uh, infection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it will be another thing. Um, yeah, so, so if you ask me whether or not 
um, it's the same, it's obviously different. Um, I think the solution um, for, for this is yet to be seen. Um, I mean, if I have the answer, then probably start the startup already, right? <laughs> okay. Well, how about David or Antizar? What's your take on that? Yeah, maybe I can start. I guess the uh, um, this situation today is cannot be compared to whatever crisis that we have gone, uh, we have passed, uh, gone through before. Because uh, back in 2009, uh, the root cause was actually the financial situation in the U.S. And uh, uh, many people, many countries in Asia are actually not really affected. And uh, right now, uh, the crisis actually impacted not only the way we do business, but with the way we do our daily stuff. Now we have to wear masks, we cannot go out, we have to uh, uh, maintain distance. So the way the, it changed the whole things after the whole uh, uh, variables in our life. So <laughs> I guess this cannot be compared in the first, time, in the, in the first place with the, uh, uh, the previous crisis. And uh, I guess uh, with this, uh, we, uh, uh, this situation, of course, it will take time for everyone to adapt. Uh, uh, with this new situation and it will take uh, I guess it will take about a year for everything to, to get normal and uh, yeah, and at this point in time we just need to stay uh, innovate and adapt with the situation yeah okay thank you to Zar. uh David any uh, last uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I would say entrepreneurs are, are quite lucky to be actually having this right now, right? Because I came to Jakarta in 2012 and, you know, at that time, Gojek was still a, was still a call center. Uh, we actually even look at it. It was a very tiny round being raised. And at, when I came, you know, I no co-working space, no ecosystem, basically, you know, very few VC. Most of them were local. Um, very, so again, no co-working space, no kind of, uh, you know, event um, documents online. It was very, very low. So the level of support available to entrepreneurs, the level of knowledge was actually very bad. Right now, as I think Michelle mentioned, right, there's still a lot of money being available and what she called the dry powder, right? So yeah, VC has still have a lot of money. I don't know if you saw the news, Kedra just raised um, 30, already 30 million, right? And it's just an example, there's so much money being, being available at the moment. So I think that's give a lot of optimism. And on top, you have so much, um, you know, like support, right? Everybody has, is playing a role. VC are adapting the way they work. Accelerator, incubators are providing additional resources. The government is also moving. You see, I think it was Mentor for Hope. You know, mentors are willing to give time. So I will say right now, you have everything to to receive that was very different back in 2009. So I will say the 2009 guys were probably less lucky and they have even to fight harder. Uh, so yeah, and also just all this tool of communication helps and so on. So yeah, I'm not that, uh, that pessimistic actually. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, for the audience, we uh, will t uh, take one or two more questions. Last questions, actually. Um, so, we got a questions from Priya. He asked, if a total addressable market or Time is important for your investment decision in a startup. What would be the typical average that you think worthwhile for a VC to go for the investment? Anyone wants to go first? Maybe David, since you already. <laughs> no, I was. Too... <laughs> uh, I don't. Know, sometimes you know, it's not so much about the time. It's you know, it's a, a time sum sum, right? I think it's more basically what you can realistically. Uh, uh, um, tap into right. Um, mm -hmm. So for us, funny, funny speaking, we are we are not we are less of a VC, meaning we are a bit different from actually looking at market sizing, fast 
growth, you know, top line, which was the previous sort of VC mindset, etc. We did invest in, in Burgreens, right? The Burgreens, if you look at TAM, or SAM SOM, actually it's not that impressive, right? Because we are talking about health, health, healthy, healthy lifestyle vegetarian or vegan or plant-based diet etc so actually if you look at it from a vc point of view then it doesn't look so appealing right but actually considering there's not so many competitors then actually the market become more appealing for us and then we also look beyond that we look at what could happen we anticipate it on the market so from us and especially local angel investor market sizing has never been a deal breaker um, we care more about sometimes competition saturation um, we try to see moves, you know, is there any consolidation, is there any some acquisition trends, etc. So in our case, market sizing is not actually uh, the main, um, the main lev- um, element of consideration. And so I don't have a number actually, because we did a look at stuff that are billions of dollars and things that are more in the range of hundred million dollar market. I see. Okay. How about um, Tizar or Michelle? Yeah, maybe I can continue. So uh, for, for, for me, myself, uh, if I look at the deck, this slide is actually I don't like to see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, I guess uh, when, uh, whenever uh, we would like to invest, uh, we look at the micro level first. And in general, we have some information on our, uh, our hand, our head already. And the second thing is like in Indonesia, it's uh, data is something that's very very difficult to, to get so that's why if we look at oh the time is like a billion US dollars two billion US dollars the, the bigger it is the more uh, I don't know whether it's uh, it, it, more believable or not yeah so for us is uh, we but the, the time is actually as uh, David mentioned also it's a good uh, checking mechanism uh, market sizing is a good checking uh, mechanism that uh, all founders has to uh, follow. I mean, to ensure that that's it worthwhile to, to actually enter to this market to, to do to set up this company, whether uh, the value, the potential growth is there or not. But uh, in terms of the number, I don't really care. It's just about at, at this point when we invest, uh, we don't really care how big the time is. But it's a checking mechanism. For example, if the time is only like one billion US dollars, and you uh, you for, foresee that you will achieve that one billion US dollars in the first year, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, so it's just a checking mechanism. Yeah. I see. Uh, do you agree with uh, Tizar and David, Michelle? Um, or do you have actually, other for opinions? Us it's, it's quite important. Um, so uh, I guess different to Tizar, we actually look at this slide uh, and we we'll always ask uh, questions because like Tizar mentioned, the data is obviously dirty, right, in Indonesia. So a lot of times we'll always like ask, where did you get this from? And I think, again, it's not so much on the accuracy of the TAM, it's more on how the founders think um, and, and you figure out how, how the logic behind him or her choosing certain industry. And I think like a lot of times uh, people are just copying whatever is relevant in China, in the US, uh, without really thinking about the local market uh, and whether or not there is a market here. Um, you know, something that worked in Australia, in America uh, or in, the, in China might not work here because there's not enough addressable market here. Uh, the population demography is different. Um, you know, everything is different here. So I think, you know, working on the market size is a good exercise um, you know, for founders to kind of like think whether or not their solution is um, appropriate for this market. Um, yeah, like uh, as Tezar mentioned, it's a checking mechanism whether or not the person can think logically as well, right? Um, and for us, I think the numbers that we always float around is minimum 100 million. Um, just because that's our target for every startup that we invest in, um, you know, like we want to, it's a thesis, at the end of the day, we want to make at least, you know, 20, 30 X. So we enter at like, we always say that basically we enter at, you know, 5 million, then we want you to grow to 100 million so that we can make 120 X return. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to remind the audience, uh, last questions. So make it count, guys.
Okay, so um, maybe last questions. Um, do you guys have any advice on how to utilize the fun after race? I think for the usage of fund, nothing changed. You know, I think it's more or less the business as usual, right? Uh, you know, so I would say, based on our discussion, nothing has changed actually in terms of usage of fund. It's it has to be related to your plan. So you have basically a certain vision of where you want to take your business. You have a certain strategy, and then milestones, and then it leads to numbers, right? Where you're going to spend it. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably where you spend it doesn't necessarily change. Probably you need to be slightly less, um, a bit more realistic and have also a certain, certain type of contingency plan or certain type of adjustment, right? Um, so that's all. I think we just need to include in your projections some factors that you don't control. But I think that's what matters. But the way you spend the money, is that I think I don't think it changed anything uh, so much, right? Okay, um, uh, Tizar and Michelle, do you have the same thought, the same thinking, David, or do you want to add? For me, I can add for uh, whenever we uh, uh, we meet with the uh, 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 founders, uh, we uh, always uh, honor the uh, the opinion of the founders themselves. So we ask what they want to plan because at the end of the day, it's their company. We just want our job is actually to help them to achieve their own dream. So, uh, um, but then at this situation, as again, I just repeat again, cash is king. So uh, you, you just need to be careful in terms of whatever uh, 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 money that you spend. So, uh, just make it count. So if you spend $1, make sure that that $1 generate something to your company, whether it is growth, whether it's revenue or whatever, awareness or traffic or anything. So just make it count and, and careful with the, uh, the runway. Okay, thank you, David. Mm -hmm. I think it's Michelle? similar for me. Um, I, I think, you know, nothing's really changed. Um, when, when you're a very early stage, then the use of funds should be for growth. And when you're at the later stage, then you probably need to start thinking about profitability. I think that that's the same message that we convey um, to a lot of our startups. Um, it's just a matter of, I think, you know, being more aware of the situation and being aware that, you know, fundraising might change in a few years. Um, so, you know, making sure that in two years time when your uh, projection uh, decided, uh, you know, that you don't have enough runway, that then uh, what will happen if you don't have enough uh, path to profitability, then, then it might be a problem, right? So just thinking about that, having that at the back of my, our, uh, their mind, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's good enough for us. Hey, thank you, Michelle. Um, I think we ran out of time. Um... Thank you so much for you guys, uh, Tizar, David, and Michelle today. And just want to remind the audience some of uh, your questions. Um, if you guys are, you can, our speakers in the chat box, they have, uh, like, for example, if you want to email about travel. Like I think Tizar mentioned about uh, Travelio, one of your portfolio startups, right? So we have uh, one of our audience asked about travel, um, but you've answered already in the beginning. So you can uh, email to info at calibracapital.com. Or if you want to ask uh, David, I think David are also uh, Post his email in the chat. Yeah. You guys, uh, and I guess the session ends. Um, I would like to well thank you again for your time, and I want to pass back to Lutfi to close the session. 
Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Melissa. So I just want to thank, thank all you. of you guys that that already attending this event. Thank you very much. That already uh, spending uh, with time, uh, spending time with us to learn about this uh, this event. <clears throat> uh, I also want to thank David, Tizar, Michelle, and of course our moderator, Melissa. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media, umgidlab.id, Plug and Play Indonesia, Ventura Discoveries, Alpha Momentum Indonesia, Angin.id, Colibra Capital, and Skystar Sky Capital. See you, and, see you at another event, guys. Thank you very much. See you. Thank you. Thank you.